And then now it's learning learning from my grandchildren about how they're kind of approaching the world and that that's an important part of it also. But curiosity, if you're curious, you are learning all the time. You're listening to the Building a Coaching Culture podcast. If you need to compete and win in the 21st century labor market as an employer of choice, this podcast is for you. Each week, we share leadership development, coaching, and culture development insights from leading experts who are developing world-class cultures in their own organizations. And now, here's your host, J.R. Flatter. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I'm J.R. Flatter, and this is our podcast, Building a Coaching Culture. And we're super excited to have as our distinguished guest, Stephanie Christopher. And uh, Stephanie, I'll... Uh, Thank you, JR. I'm sorry, you go, you go first. I was just, I'm so excited to be distinguished. <laughs> I was diving in. <laughs> so just real quickly remind everybody who our listeners are, uh, leaders of complex organizations just like yours, who are finding ways to compete and succeed in this 21st century. We're well into the 21st century. I, I'm not going to mention exact day or year, but we're a quarter of the way through. And so how do we compete and succeed? And we believe it's a building a coaching culture. What does that mean and how do you do that? So that's kind of where we're at. What we would love to start with is just let you introduce yourself. And please, I know you're humble, but brag about yourself and the great work you're doing. Thanks, JL. Clearly not that humble because, you know, I wouldn't even let you speak. (laughs) I have an interesting role. I'm the managing director of a parent company. We have two very distinct businesses. One is a legacy business that's over 60 years old in the States and over 37, I think, in Australia, and it's called the Executive Connection. So it's an organisation that's bringing together CEOs, business owners, people are dealing with exactly what you're talking about. And it's about peer advisory, mentoring and coaching and and learning from the best. So that's one business. And then we have a new business, Build Academy, which is a startup. And that's an edutech business that's all about closing that gap between knowledge and action. Build Academy is all about taking action and making progress rather than just throwing more content out there on uh, a very crowded world for business leaders. So that's my role. I have a clinical background originally. I was a speech language pathologist in a past, past, past life and uh, various consulting roles along the way that found me to this current one eight years ago. Great. So talk to us about tech a little bit, if you don't mind. How do I get involved? And it sounds like there's two sides. There's the chair and then there's the leader or however you might describe them. Yeah, so people come to us or chairs by them, but it's it's generally a CEO or a business owner who's grappling with common issues and they feel like they're on their own. You know, it's it's lonely running a business. It's 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 lonely and they'd never probably say that word, but they're struggling with how do I grow my business? The big struggle right now is there's a change in the world. It's complex. We survived two years, but there's some big opportunities and I just don't know what to do. And you talked about it before, JR. People talent is the biggest issue on everyone's mm-hmm. mind. I'm a member. I, I sit in a, in a peer advisory group and everyone is just talking about people. I, I hire someone, I train them up, and then they're, they're pinched for ridiculous amounts of money or How do I keep people happy? What am I, you know, I know what I should be doing, but I'm coping with the day to day because I'm in the business. And then our groups are led, facilitated, but but led by someone we call a chair, a tech chair. And this is a business leader who may have, who may have retired from a corporate career or they may be mid-career and this really suits their portfolio. And they're all about getting the most out of the group. You know, I love there's a a line that actually works for leaders as well about let the group do the heavy lifting. Don't tell. No one wants to hear your opinion. 
that that's the group experience. And then as a member, you also have a one-to-one with your chair that is probably kind of bleeding more into that coaching side with a bit of mentoring thrown in, a bit of if you do that, you're going to fall off a cliff. Mm. So let's talk about it. Yeah. So it's a it's an interesting model and, you know, through the pandemic, we found it more important than ever and, and a big part of it was the tribe and my own experience. I kind of cut out a lot of other things that I would be involved in and thought these are my people, this is my tribe, this is my chair, that's where I'm going to put my energy for others and to receive it back in spades for myself. Mm. So I'm in the arc of my business and I'm, it sounds like a lot of entrepreneurs. So I'm in the arc of my entrepreneurial journey. When do I know it's the right time to find you? It varies. It varies. So we have CEOs who are a first time CEO, two months in. We have CEOs who've been doing this for years and years and years. And the business has the business has maybe stalled mm. and they want to know what to do. Or someone towards the end of their entrepreneurial journey looking mm-hmm. to exit and knowing that the business is all about me and I know this stuff I have to do. We have a beautiful story of a member who is just going to walk away from his business and he found a group and they said, are you joking? Put this in place, do this, do this. And he, he exited very successfully. So at the bigger end in the larger businesses, people come at all different stages. And there's also their board, if they have a board, Often the board, the chairman of the board will say, you need to be in tech. I know someone in tech, Mm. you need to be in. Now in our smaller, our kind of mid-sized business, and and perhaps they're more entrepreneurial in a way in that they're the founder, they're probably more likely to come to us a little later. I've worked my way up. I've been on the tools. I've got this thing going. Help. Now I've got people. What do I do with this thing? However, going forward, we're seeing more and more truly entrepreneurial leaders who are doing something really disruptive, something really exciting, and they want to partner with us or they want to learn from wiser heads early on, and that's really exciting for me too. So we're not a startup hub. We're more for organisations who are on the way, have got over that, they've got a business, they're, they're making some money but they need to understand what they don't know and how you put together a really robust and sustainable business. Any particular revenue stream, more than zero, less than 100 million? Well, tech, tech really is ideally from we've got a, we have a whole model for businesses in that one to five million, so that small, small business. And then above that, it's five mm-hmm. to hundreds. Our sweet spot really is probably 30 to $50 million revenue mm. turnover. But, you know, and it, that, it's all about diversity mm-hmm. in the group. So we don't don't organise our groups based on revenue stream. There's not, well, you're $15 million, therefore you go into this kind of group. In the group I'm in, there's a, there's a not-for-profit and there's a hundreds of million-dollar business and everything in between. And it's about the leader, not the business. Our original founder in Australia, Phil Medding, said it's about increasing the effectiveness and enhancing the lives of CEOs and business owners. So it's about both. One more, I promise, Lucas, and then I'm going to be quiet. So you're a cousin to an American organization or sister, however you'd make that relationship. So it's not just for the people in Australia or New Zealand, but same is going on here. That's right. Vistage International, which is in Many, many countries around the world, okay. like 25,000 members yeah. around the world. And yes, we are. We are. And we partner with Vistage. We have a, another tech okay. in Canada. Tech is the original name. And we're also very, very close to our colleagues in Canada. Very similar worlds, Canada and Australia. So, But yes, and Vistage is terrific based out of San Diego. Yeah, that's indirectly the way we met because we both have a mutual associate. All right, look, the floor is yours, sir. <laughs> um, so you talk a lot about, you know, forming these communities and how much value there is in that. Is there any practical, like what practical things do you do to kind of like 
match people with the right community and build the community so it you know it's a healthy ecosystem kind of thing i love that question i love that word matching because it's only recently that we've had a look at what we do and we've said do you know the core of it is the matching is getting that right so we speak to prospective members one of one of my team does and they have a really deep conversation. In fact, often after that first phone call, business owner, CEO will say, I've never spoken like that with anyone. No one's spoken to me like that. And they're really right at the core of, I, you know, that peeling the onion to coaching. The problem presenting isn't the problem, you know, going really deep to what it is. And so by then they're really understanding what that member is looking for, what they're really looking for in this who they are, what type of person they are, and that's where the matching comes in. So the second conversation is about this is the group, this is the chair that I think is going to be right for you. And we have conversations, group fit conversations, we call them, where they'll say, look, you know, this is who Lucas is and and he's really, you know, earlier stage in his career and he's really dynamic and I think he'll fit in. And and then there will be a, an open conversation about, well, do you know what's happening in a group? X, you know, tech 11 group, there's, there's actually someone like that who could add value there. So that matching is critical and it's the job of the chair to really foster that tribe and keep an eye on the dynamic at any time. And also for the members, so we stay in touch with the members and and I'm speaking to someone later today who was originally in one group that was we thought would be a perfect fit for her and she came to us and said, this isn't, this isn't it. So she's joined another group and is thriving. So that matching is critical for us. So you're obviously from your bio and just listening to you, a very successful leader. Give our listeners some advice on how to succeed in this hyper-competitive labor market, not just with labor, but business in general. Everything changes so fast. Technology is changing. Expectations changing. It's a little bit of slowing down to Mm. speed up. So it's almost like two brains happening because sometimes I feel as if I'm going so fast, I'm just going to fly and drop off the edge. But at the same time, the other side of my brain, and my husband talks about it, I, I actually really like this. Well, obviously, years ago he said, You know, in the matrix, when the bullet started flying, he slows down. And I kind of try to Mm. hold that in the other side of my brain of just slow down and just think this through. Mm. So I think that, JR, I think that's critical to be able to operate at two Mm. speeds because you have to move quickly. You have to, and particularly on the talent side, if you come across something that, or someone, (laughs) something, someone that you know is right for your business or someone internally that you're spotting there's a challenge, you have to move quickly but not impulsively. Mm. Yeah. I think that's what I'm getting at. The difference between impulsive and pace is so important right now and that's a bit of a challenge for me because I can make up my mind really quickly and say, great, let's do it right now. And just the other day, one of my team said, I said, all right, let's bring her in. Let's talk to her right now. And he went, no, 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 hold up, hold up. That's going to look like you've just been reactive. Just slow down. And then I realized and it let me think it through a little bit. I think that's the skill right now more mm. than ever because you have to be fast. No, I love that analogy. I know that sometimes as a leader, you, you can kind of f- fall into this lull, this sense that I, I've got it all figured out. Do you ever encounter people that are, you know, joining one of the tribes that kind of have this, you know, they don't really believe that they're going to be able to transform their leadership or skeptics? What do you say to them? It's really interesting. That, that What a great question. Because the, they might come as a skeptic with, no, no problems. What's the biggest issue you're facing right now? No, nope, nothing. All good. All good. I remember someone once that it was actually at a breakfast and having this conversation. And it was talking about the seven skills of successful leaders and it was something about people and she gave herself a 10 out of 10. I said, there's no such thing as a 10 out of 10. Trust me, you will go back to your office 
and someone will knock on your door and say, can I can I have a word with you? And they're about to resign. But anyway, she said, no, 10. And I said, are you growing your business? Yes, yes, yes. Do you have the people to grow your business? Yes, 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 I'll be fine. So some people just aren't right, Lucas. Some people it's just not right for, and we do say it, we say tech has to be right for you and you have to be right for tech. And if you're not, you're not. But also you see it in a group because people might come in with a bit, you know, with that kind of armour on and I've got this and I'm really confident and I'll show you my plan on a page and here's what I've done. And then three, maybe four sessions in, bang, the vulnerability shows and they just go, you know, I couldn't have done this without you. Whereas other people walk in, blah, this is everything on my mind, out it comes and then they walk away and say, oh, I left dancing, I feel so much better. So it's about diversity, but but if someone truly believes that they've got nothing to get as well as give, they're not they're not right. And that'll emerge pretty quickly, probably before they even join. So I want to switch gears a little bit, if you don't mind, to Build Academy, because I'm really excited about this. So we have some marquee products and our true core competency is coaching and coaching accreditation which I suspect a lot of other organizations have this competency, but they need other world-class content to go along with it. And in our potential working together, it's freelancing or entrepreneurship or culture development. Or So talk to us a little bit about this Brainchild Build Academy and, and how, if I'm a leader of a complex organization, you would be helpful for me. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's really exciting. And that's the two hats for me. And kind of, I see myself getting excited about the different businesses relatively at different times. And and maybe today that's, you know, right now it's one of those things where I say going so fast, I have to be careful. I don't. I mean, I can see Sydney <laughs> Harbour out my window and make sure I didn't just go splash <laughs> right into the harbour. So Build Academy came out of research, came out of talking to, to you know, maybe that earlier stage entrepreneur that person who was just getting slammed by content. One of the people we spoke to was a farmer, a farmer who was talking about succession for his family. I'm sure it's a similar situation in the States, you know, and and he had the farm, but what's going to happen after he moves on? And he said he had spent $250,000 on consultants and had nothing, no answer, nothing, none of his problems addressed. And we were, you know, we heard more and more, and this was pre-pandemic, people say, I don't need any more content. I'm up to my eyeballs in filling whatever word you like, stuff. I don't need any more stuff. I just want to know what to do and when to do it. And so then this idea came up about, what about if we focused on taking action and then the content or the learning was a byproduct? That's what it's about, you you know, take action and, of course, you learn along the way. So rather than, again, we did some interesting analysis. I was looking at an early pitch deck yesterday that we talked about if you went and found the right content, this is how many hours it could take you and you could put a cost on it. But if you actually were able to take action because you had the right content at the right time, it cuts the hours way, way down because we're feeding it to you. So that's what it's about. And so our business accelerators, as they're called, are about five actions. And we've got the, you know, cute buzz line, five actions in five days. And it's giving you just the right information you need from an expert in the field to be able to take action straight away. And we've just had some interesting feedback from some research we've done that people got so much value from the activities and the templates would sit in each action. We kind of hypothesized that people would say their greatest value was afterwards I've done this and now I've transformed my business and I've put in a REM strategy that's going to work for everyone. But the fascinating feedback was actually physically taking the action while going through the accelerator is is what what had the impact on you. So how is this valuable for organizations? It's Look, it's pitched at all sorts of levels, JR. It's it's pitched at the founder or it might be really relevant for a team. We've had feedback also on teams going through this together has really worked for them. 
and also individuals to take the time to, and it's not a lot of time, it just accelerates two and a half hours, but to actually take the time to take those action mm. steps. So the, yeah, so the plan is with each accelerator also that by the time you complete it and take those five actions, you've done a really significant piece of work for your organisation. So you may have, by the end of it, developed a whole plan for difficult conversations in a coaching context and you have a, a coaching plan developed at the end of your action, at your five actions, or, you know, one that's a, a real favourite is that by the end of five actions, you have a sales process documented for your organisation off you go. So it fits in with complexity when you have to do things quickly, but you have to do the right things. And I, I think that's where we fit. I like that idea because even when you're, you know, you have a bunch of content, you could just, without that mindset that I'm going to have to go take action, you could keep learning and keep learning and keep learning and you might never like take that first step. Do you think that kind of attitude shift is what's so important about taking action? Lucas, it is critical. Again, some feedback from some user research we've just done was, you know, once I took the first action, it was really easy. Once I got started, it was really easy. And so for us, as we're looking, you know, at ongoing product development is how can we help people just to get started so that that taking action at the beginning is a behavioral economics challenge, I think, for us to, to look at because, you know, there's intent and that first action is mm -hmm. so important. Well, I know from our own experiences, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. And I don't know if I could give you five actions in five days to become an entrepreneur with the clarity that you've established. And the same thing is in social media, right? There's this wealth of information. How do you sort through all of it and know there's the classic line from Stephen Covey, hey, we're in the wrong jungle. <laughs> Shut up and keep chopping, right? You remember <laughs> <Yeah>. that? <laughs> Get out of the yeah, tree and keep do. chopping. I love it. So bringing that kind of crispness, if I might add, uh, to those critical topics, mm. I think it's just essential. You know, that's the real challenge with the experts we work with, the kind of curse of knowledge. So each of our accelerators, we work with a leading expert in the field and and, and we, have a, we have a great posse of experts. And they come and, oh, no, no, but I have to tell mm. them this, but they need mm. to know that, they need to know this. And I have a very bright product team. And someone I work with will will talk to the experts. One of the first things she does is an interview with the expert and gets all this stuff. And then it's all for her about synthesizing all that stuff to be able to sort of get it to kind of to the five actions. And it's one of my favorite parts of my job is when we get down to, to that, you know, this is what I think the five actions are. And what she's come up with, which I love, is Shakespearean and it's the five acts of, a, oh, yeah, of yeah, Shakespeare. Yeah. And As you like it. It's so <laughs> fun, they are. Yeah, and, and she's young and I'm not and we just had this great conversation about it and she said, there's this word, I don't know how to pronounce, I said it's <laughs> denouement. And she went, oh, okay, I've never known how to pronounce it. So I'm having these great high school English conversations but it actually relates to business and entrepreneurship. <laughs> immediately so talk to us about some of the topics for your accelerators i know you're growing the catalog what are some of the top of your head that if i'm listening and i'm wondering about how to do five things in five what some of those might yeah, yeah. in five days yeah so what we've done is divide them really into the what are the areas on the mind of an entrepreneur um and if someone again as i say it's not they're not about how to build a product. We've got some. We've got a whole innovation suite and boot camp that we're 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 looking at as well. But so we have things about all right. Well, what's my goal setting and strategy? And we have two of the best experts. I mean, both of them. It's amazing that we can bring that's that's also a passion of mine to bring this expertise to people who would never be able to afford someone at this level. So there, there's a great one about setting your own business and personal goals and then one about, well, what's my strategic positioning for my business? And, and they're, they're important. 
there's one that sort of cuts across that is perhaps the most popular right now, and that's time management, which is which is interesting. And then we get into the sales suite and watch my eyes light up and my shoulders drop here and we get really excited. I wish I had all this. I wish I had all this earlier in my career. But there's, you know, the fundamentals of identifying your ideal customer. So sales and marketing all together, identifying your ideal customer, building your sales process, sales leadership and coaching, which is a whole art and science of its own. A great one on sales skills with Tom Hughes, who's a, a global leader in sales skills. And then we get into LinkedIn and social media and even one Instagram for business. So for an entrepreneur who needs to get a commercial Instagram account happening but doesn't even know where to start, five actions in five days and you're up and running. And then we move into people, the big one. So recruitment, what's your recruitment plan and process, building high-performing teams, managing for performance. And, you know, we've got one in there on remuneration strategy, building a REM strategy by popular demand. And I think it needs a 2022-2023 edition, which is where it comes back to coaching, that just having a, a standard strategy is not going to work in the world right now. It's a great place to start and to understand. And then I think we're going to need more as well. So as you say, we are growing the library and what we're really loving is those users, partners coming to us and say, could we do something together on X? We've built a model on how to grow them. And as as one of my product team said to me, you know, I've got this thing for building an accelerator. What do we call it? We said it's a particle accelerator. So we have a particle accelerator that, that allows us to grow accelerator to build accelerators. But that that's the future of Build Academy JR is going to be the co-creation in partnership. And that's really exciting because who knows what the topics are going to be. So I know at at least one that I want to recommend for the list. So five days to developing my culture. (laughs) That's a mystery to a lot of people. Yeah, culture. And it's not as hard as you might think it is. But again, like sorting through all the information and trying to find those five critical things. And not going down the pathway. What what we want to break away from or I do. It's just kind of a standard consulting model, you know, that a consultant comes in with their model. If you said, look, I want to develop my culture. Okay, great. Well, here's what it'll be. Here's my retainer. And you find yourself doing something else that's got nothing to do with what you want to achieve. I kind of think that's the new too much content challenge as well that that I think we can disrupt here too. So you have um, all these different accelerators in, in the Build Academy are there things that you know you're you've been learning over time that are like these are general properties that help all of our courses without giving away trade secrets? I had one of my team telling me all these insights yesterday on a you know on a Zoom Teams call, and it was great. And I can you know I'm auditory, I can hear things, but at the end I think, can you just put this in a deck? <laughs> I said this was a lot of rich information you've just kind of put at me. You know, one of the big things we've learned is nudging back again to behavioral economics, the power of Mm. the nudge. So what we've learned is people are really interested in being bothered, hassled. You know, you know that truism that I'm not sure about that people say, oh, people don't want any more emails and you can't bother people and they're all very busy. And I think, no, I just want good emails. I just want well written emails that actually get my attention. So we've done some, in our latest round of user testing, it's really interesting on what nudging works. And people like text messages, uh, they're fine with an email if if it's going to help. But that's one of the bits that we're really looking at. I recently learned the entrepreneurial term, which I love on the startup term of concierge MVP, that you're building something and you kind of, you know, Underneath the water, you're really paddling hard. And our nudging at the moment is a little bit concierge MVP. And as we go to the next level of technology, it'll be all about how can that be inherent. I wouldn't mind if I got a text every morning or a message came up on a platform saying, hey, it's Friday, and why don't you do that first action 
before you clock off for the weekend. So that that's something that we've really learned. And that other thing I was talking about, about getting started, that there's clearly a piece about intent, motivation, probably even something there about self-talk up front. How can we get across that bridge so that someone gets started? Yeah, referencing my husband again, there was an early, early prototype of a cybersecurity accelerator, really early, and he still hasn't done his first action. And we kind of joke about it that, you know, he's got an accountability buddy and and the, the joke always is, how's that, how's that first action going? So he is rare and clearly his intent and motivation wasn't there. He was just helping out. But there is definitely something for me about crossing that divine at the front to change gears a little bit, you talk a lot about being a lifelong learner. We talk about the pace of life, and I love your analogy, slow. We we say that in swimming, slow down to speed up. What does it mean to you to be a lifelong learner? If you were to tell your peers or people listening, what does it mean to be a lifelong learner? Be curious. Be cu- Wake up curious and try and end your day with, with some answers or some next things to look at the next day. But just be curious because it's the most exciting thing about life. It, it's what keeps you alive and keeps you, you know, young is a funny old word to use there, but it is because there's no, there's no finish line then. Just be curious and be open to different different things. So for me, I'm challenging myself all the time and saying out loud even to my team, you know what, maybe maybe that's okay after all. Maybe that thing we thought was terrible and the wrong way to do it and thank God we don't do it like that. Maybe there's information that we don't have yet and maybe we should look at that. So that's important to me. And there's another thing that I know about myself and that's the science of it. So I guess it's also being reflective about what kind of learning works mm. for you. So someone said to me the other day, well, there's, you know, there's science in this and mm. bang. I went, okay, well, mm. now I'm interested. So it's knowing what works. You know, a whole lot of opinion will turn me off. But I know what learning works for me. And I know to be open, you know, you were talking at the beginning about our multi-generation conversation here. In my own life as a lifelong learner, I love learning from my from all my generations, you know. I love learning from my children saying things and going, no, that's not actually how that's done now or there's another way. And then now it's learning learning from my grandchildren about how they're kind of approaching the world and that that's an important part of it also. But curiosity, if you're curious, you are learning all the time. You were the one quoting Shakespeare, as you like it, and the five stages of, I look on that as different stages in life and generational impacts. And, you know, we yeah. have quotes from millennia ago about the slothfulness of today's children. So <laughs> take it with a grain <laughs> of salt. Well, that's right. Because they're not. Well, I don't, I don't say it. I mean, you know, I had a granddaughter this morning. She's five and a poor mother, she was doing craft before school this morning and her mother had just woken up and went, oh, I don't want to build a tree. <laughs> you know, How about breakfast and school shoes? You know? <laughs> For the record, I'm a justice now. I well, used to be a soldier, so now I'm a justice. So kind of following up on what JR was asking about learning, um, you mentioned like kind of having that English school teacher hat and thinking critically about media do you tend to do that with, you know, movies that you watch and shows and things? And have you learned any lessons about leadership or anything from media? Wow. Boy, that's a, that's a, there's a few things to unpack there. Let me start. My mom was the school teacher. I wasn't. English and Latin. So there's two things. So I'm a bit of a stickler for grammar too. So what do I learn when I'm critically reading and from my clinical background? So there's the science can't just say something and it's fact. You know, it, it has to be tested. You can't just say this is this. It has to be tested. So that one I'll always be critical about. 
you know, I was a speech pathologist, so with the linguistics there, I'm very funny about words. So if someone says, you know, here's a press release and this person said that, and I think, no, they didn't. They didn't say that. They don't talk like that. They don't think like that. So it's anti-curiosity there, Lucas, to sort of not close your, to close your mind to something. What have I learned about leadership? Do you know I learn it in every single thing that I watch? Everything I watch, there's a lesson there or there's a, an allegory or or it's interesting to watch, you know, when when I used to travel to the States more frequently, I'll get back to it. Succession. You know, I loved Succession. And so there was so much in, in watching that and seeing what leadership, you know, Morning Wars, thinking about, well, how has all that been handled in in organisations and in society? When you see, you know, there's a, a minor scandal, and I'm going to it happening in Australia this week. And for me, it's looking at well, where was the where was the coaching and guidance on the way? Where was the partnership with you know with the employee? And what what role did the organisation have in this? And then it gets back to and what do you say? Pi- I don't know if you say pylon. Do you say pylon in the states about the the pylon that's happened yeah, yeah, yeah. on this person? Mm-hmm. So when you know, yeah, yeah, yeah probably my pronunciation, but, you know, what? what's the role of society then in the pylon and where's the leadership there? Where's someone sort of stepping up? And so I learn about perhaps critically viewing on all sorts of levels, but I'm always critically viewing who's helping this person. So maybe that comes from my inherent leadership or my experience with tech, but who's with that person? Who are they talking to? You know, I'm seeing this behaviour, but who's challenging them or who's talking to them? That That's probably the thing I'm always looking for. Well, thank you. That was a great answer. Thanks. Well, that concludes this episode of Building a Coaching Culture. I truly hope that this episode was helpful to you. If it was, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe stop and give us a rating or a review and share this podcast with someone who might find it helpful as well. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.